Of the many monstrous creatures that roam the Warhammer world, there are none so infamous as trolls. Although exceptionally strong, these creatures are remarkably stupid, even when compared to most mindless beasts. If it weren't for their resilience, they likely would have gone extinct, but their impressive regeneration has led to trolls being one of the most commonly found monsters on almost every continent. Beyond granting them the power to regrow limbs, internal organs, or even decapitated heads, the regeneration of these creatures has also allowed them to adapt to virtually every known environment on the planet. River trolls, stone trolls, and ice trolls are all known strains that can be discovered in the right places, but none can match the strange variety of the horrific chaos trolls. Saturated with the magical energies that swirl in the Northlands, Chaos Trolls' natural regeneration causes them to develop an alarming amount of mutations in short order, like an aggressive cancer. Normally, these additions are purely physical, such as extra mouths, protruding spikes, or tentacles, but legend has it there is a troll who was altered in mind as well. Deep in the icy lands of Troll Country is said to dwell an elder beast possessed with a dark intellect, a monstrous king who sits upon a rocky throne surveying his realm of trolls and snow. The one Kislevites have come to call Wintertooth, the chaos troll that bears the name Throg. Much of the Troll King's early history is a mystery unknown both to him and the wider world. Most likely, he was born in Troll Country, growing over the course of many years to become one of the countless monsters to lurk in that land. Due to the physiology he would one day possess, Throg must have at some point wandered north into the Chaos Wastes, where the winds of magic blow strong. Here, the troll encountered many enemies that sought to kill him, whether it be champions of the Dark Gods seeking glory, or simply another monster looking for a meal. Each one of these foes failed, however, whether pulverized by massive fists or dissolved by acidic vomit. Throg's regeneration played the most important factor in these victories, as it was a potent force even when compared against others of his kind, though this made him particularly susceptible to mutating. During one of these many battles for survival, the Wintertooth suffered a horrendous blow to his thick skull that scattered his brains along the ground. Despite missing most of his head, however, Throg did not die as any natural creature should. Instead, he began to regenerate. But this time, the mutation that the gods saw fit to give him was something truly unique. When the Troll King's head finished reforming, the beast was suddenly capable of thought. He was self-aware, able to observe his surroundings for the first time in his life. It wasn't just a simple mockery of intelligence, either. Throg's mind possessed an alarmingly quick wit, and developed exponentially. His curiosity and desire to learn was only matched by his ravenous hunger, typical of all trolls. The Wintertooth set about making observations on the world around him, and quickly identified the Chaos Waste as a place lacking in abundant food and treasure. So he went south returning to the snow-covered realm of Troll Country that bordered with Kislev. It was around this time that Throg learned his most extraordinary ability of being able to speak the tongues of men. Whether this was learned from captive teachers who were subsequently devoured, or just innately understood due to some quirk from the Dark God's gift is entirely unknown. Regardless, this skill opened a brand new world, and most importantly, gave him the ability to develop and build upon complex ideas. With this ability to form plans, Throg roamed the windswept wasteland of Troll Country and set about gathering numerous monstrous beasts to his banner. Trolls already have an innate habit of gathering into groups, so this proved to be an easy affair. After assembling a small force of horrific creatures, the Troll King scouted for a lair suitable to his needs. It would need to be a place large enough to accommodate the beasts rallying to his call, but also hidden well enough that no army could easily stumble upon him. 
It was beneath the mountains just south of the Tower of Crack that Throg would find such a prize. He discovered an icy labyrinth, large enough to easily confuse any intruder who was guided by mere sight alone, at the center of which resided a massive boulder. Grinning ear to ear with his grotesquely large mouth, the Wintertooth smashed the rock repeatedly with his colossal strength, until it resembled a throne. The king had his castle. Now with an established lair, Throg gathered up his kin and set about launching a devastating series of raids upon the lands of men surrounding his home. Normally, large caravans and hunting parties had little to fear from trolls, so they passed through his lands with only the typical defenses against such stupid brutes. Unfortunately for them, bonfires and loud gunshots only attracted the hungry attention of Troll Country's new king. Throg specialized in launching midnight raids, able to galvanize his kin into vicious ambushes in the dead of night. Knowing that humans couldn't see well in the dark, and that they certainly weren't prepared for such brutal assaults, each one of these attacks proved to be a massacre. The Troll King's horde gorged themselves on flesh, and he claimed a great amount of treasure to enjoy. These night ambushes continued to prove effective, as even if the odd merchant survived and escaped to warn others, none would believe them. An army of monsters led by an intelligent troll? At best, they would be a laughingstock, and at worst, committed to the not-so-tender mercies of the old world's many asylums. Yet eventually, the reoccurring disappearance of armed caravans did become concerning enough for the truly wealthy to invest more heavily in guarding their treasures. At first, this deterrent proved successful, for Throg wouldn't engage a foe expecting him with superior arms without some sort of upper hand. So as trolls do, he adapted. The land of Troll Country is a truly harsh climate, with mighty ice shard blizzards constantly ravaging the landscape that can flay the flesh from men foolish enough to stand outside in one. Yet to trolls, this deadly weather was no more concerning than a light summer rain. Realizing this, when Throg spotted a target, he would gather his kin and wait patiently for one of the storms to arrive. The Troll King had a knack for understanding the winter storm's paths, and was always exactly where he wanted to be when the full brunt arrived. Utilizing the cover provided by the slicing hail, the trolls would charge roaring into their foes and tear them apart. By the time the storms pass, all that remained were shattered carriages and plentiful amounts of gore-slicked ice. It was these terrifying winter raids that earned Throg the epithet Wintertooth. He became quite infamous among warriors of the Old World, due to the horrific tales brought back by the rare survivor of this King of Trolls. Every season, great and lauded heroes rode northwards, brave knights and adventurers, all seeking out Throg's lair to slay him. Every season, he dined upon noble flesh. They were all the same. Headstrong humans who didn't truly understand the threat of what they faced until it was too late. Only one of these aspiring champions was of any note. A man wearing a golden crown who cleaved his way through the monstrous guards of the ice labyrinth. The unknown hero battled his way to the center of the maze, where he discovered Throg glowering on a rocky throne. The warrior appeared stunned by the sight of the Troll King, who in his red tattered cloak looked to be almost mocking the lords of humanity's kingdoms. This abrupt interruption of his dinner was not well received by Throg, who swiftly lumbered across the room with his massive stone hammer in hand. The knight roared in challenge and leapt towards his foe, lashing out with an eloquently crafted sword. The Wintertooth's flesh parted easily as the blade struck true and stabbed through Throg's heart. This only caused him to roar with a mixture of anger and pain as his hammer came arcing down like a comet, pulverizing one of the knight's legs in a single blow. The man collapsed screaming in agony as the Troll King glared down at the steel protruding from his chest grunting in annoyance before removing it. If he had been any other troll, that blow may well have killed him, or at the very least may have stunned. 
Begrudgingly impressed with his squealing foe's apparent skill, Throg proceeded to vomit upon the man to grant him a swifter death than being eaten alive. Glaring down at the human's bubbling flesh, the Troll King's eyes wandered to the now filth-covered crown that rested upon the warrior's head. Truly a treasure worthy of a king, was it not? Eyes gleaming with greed, Throg tore off the human's head and deftly removed the crown before tossing the rest into his maw with a sickening crunch as he bit down. Although it was far too small for his head, Throg experimentally placed the treasure upon one of his largest tusks. It slid down about halfway before coming to a snug fit, and the Wintertooth was immensely satisfied. Now he truly was a king of this realm. Years continued to pass, and life remained consistent for the Troll King. Every year he would wait for the winter storms to come, and begin launching his devastating raids on those caravans and villages within reach. At the end of the storm season, a new batch of suicidal warriors would ride north, and inevitably find their way into his gullet. Over this time, Throg only grew, until he towered over other trolls, and even giants were wary of his brute strength. Worse still, all of the wounds he had taken over the years continued to regenerate into more mutations as the dark gods showered their prized monster with numerous gifts. Deadly bone spikes protruded from Throg's arms and back, hideous extra mouths full of razor fangs spawned along his sides, and his vomit became so horrifically potent that it could melt steel and iron as easily as flesh. This simple life couldn't last forever, though. One moonless night, as Throg was picking his yellow tusks clean with a gem-encrusted blade, he beheld the broken bodies of his prey and began to think. Throg muttered to himself, his eyes burning with cold fire for several long days. If the race of man was so keen to fight him and his bestial subjects, then fight he would, with all the monsters of Troll Country at his side. That night, Throg vowed that he would see the lands of men despoiled in the name of the Dark Gods. He would gather every monster, mutant, and madman under his rule, and march at the head of a nightmarish horde deep into the so-called civilized lands of the south. On his heels would come the bitter cold of winter, for where the creatures of chaos tread, the land itself warps and changes. Throg would bring about an age of ice and darkness, and make all of the races of the Old World his slaves. As the Troll King marches determinedly south, his monstrous entourage grows with every passing day. Under Throg's dominion, the creatures of the Hinterlands have united into a vast army, and soon the race of man shall feel the Troll King's wrath. Alright, now that the Troll King's history has been covered, it's time to check out his equipment. The most crucial one of Throg's items is the golden circlet that rests upon his tusk known as the Wintertooth Crown. Once the priceless heirloom of some ill-fated noble, this artifact allows Throg to exert his will over all things bestial and savage that serve the Dark Gods. Whether this is due to a magical property of the crown itself, or was a gift bestowed upon the Troll King when he claimed the item, is a mystery, but its power is far more dangerous than it first appears. Most of the monsters that join alongside the Tides of Chaos have one notable weakness, which is that they're hard to control and are either stupid or easily frightened. Throg can completely remove all those problems from the equation, replacing the dim-witted intelligence of trolls, for instance, with his own. Beyond that, the crown has allowed him to recruit beasts to his banner most would struggle to handle, as he can communicate easily with them and often manipulate such monsters into subservience. Furthermore, the Wintertooth crown's ability can be focused further to allow Throg to directly possess another monstrous creature with his own mind, which may at first seem unimpressive, until one considers this could result in a giant who is neither stupid nor clumsy. 
This makes the monstrous hordes of the Wintertooth one of the most terrifying forces on the planet as it boasts a single-minded and organized army bent to the will of a savagely intelligent lord. The only other notable piece of Throg's arsenal is the rather simple but effective great weapon that he wields. Little more than a stone-headed sledgehammer, the Troll King's preferred weapon has nothing innately unique about it other than its immense weight. This accents Throg's fighting style quite well, as he tends to favor wide swings that build up momentum to grant his attacks bone-shattering force. It would take the heaviest armor known to the old world to even hope to survive a blow from that weapon at full swing. It's little wonder that so few have crossed the Troll King's path and lived to tell the tale. With the Troll King's equipment covered, it's time to move on to his skills. Obvious by the size of the weapon he carries around, Throg possesses immense strength even when compared to other trolls. This is mostly thanks to his increased intelligence, as it makes the Wintertooth able to utilize the full range of his strength and long reach. Able to contest the might of giants, the Troll King is more than capable of pulverizing anyone who gets in his way. When it comes to defense, Throg has no need to hide behind armor or magical artifacts to protect his already tough hide. Instead, he relies purely on his aggressive regeneration, which is capable of mending even the most grievous of wounds. There's no organ or body part that cannot be repaired by this healing factor, so long as the origin of the damage isn't a flaming attack. But Throg is rather clever when it comes to avoiding this weakness. The most dangerous aspect of this ability, however, is that the Wintertooth's healing is even more potent than that of other trolls. When his body mends, instead of simply replacing the damaged tissue, his mutant regeneration instead augments his body with new mutations. It could be said that Throg is a living embodiment of whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stronger. The final carryover from the Troll King's race is his horrid ability to empty the contents of his stomach on his opponent as an attack. The vomit of most Chaos Trolls is arguably the most dangerous of all troll species, as not only is it acidic enough to dissolve steel, but tends to contain large, flesh-eating worms. Throg has mastered the art, if it can be called such, of puking deadly liquids onto his foes instead of just using it as an instinctual defense mechanism. He likes to keep a full stomach, so his copious vomit is more than enough to drown even large creatures in agonizing acids. The most unique skill of Throgs, however, is his ability to speak with and control the monstrous hordes that make up his army. When adding in the ability of his crown to assert dominance over specific creatures as well, this makes the Troll King's ability as a general quite fearsome. The monstrous horde of the Wintertooth is one of the fiercest legions in the Old World, and they bring an avalanche of cold hatred to the realms of men. Now that his skills have been addressed, it's time to examine the featured famous battle. In the Imperial Year of 2490, nearly 20 years before Throg decided to begin his invasion of the Old World, a different kind of monstrous horde was invading Troll Country. The master necromancer Hela Halfdead had gathered a massive host of shambling dead from the battlefields of Ostermark and was marching north. Scorned by the living and with a thirst for vengeance that only mass slaughter could satisfy, she raised all the dead she could find and butchered any with the misfortune to cross her path. Men, women, children, none were spared the necromancer's wrath as she sought more corpses to be added to her army. Kislev would drown under an endless tide of undead, with the other realms of men soon to follow. As the moaning legions wandered into the icy wastelands of southern troll country, Hela failed to realize that her path was marked by creatures hidden by billowing ice storms. Such a brazen force was difficult to miss, even amongst heavy blizzards for the scent of dark magic was quite heavy on the wind. It took only a few days for Throg to become aware of the undead intruding upon his lands, 
and the Troll King's brow furrowed with anger. Not only was this wizard killing all the good sport in his realm, she was also causing the earth itself to warp with necromantic power. The Wintertooth would suffer no rival claim to his lands, and unleashed an angry roar, rousing his trolls for battle. Throg swiftly located his quarry, as the overwhelming stench of rotting meat carried far in such a desolate place. The trolls following him didn't need much encouragement for this particular march, as they were already drooling in anticipation of so much rotting meat. The Wintertooth's monstrous horde approached a snow-capped overlook and gazed down upon their foe with gluttonous expressions. Throg held his subjects in check, however, his crown radiating with oppressive power that kept the idiotic creatures rooted in place. The necromancer was far too confident in her legion of undead, not even bothering to post any vanguard to scout out the treacherous terrain. Her arrogance made Hela's trespassing even more offensive to the Troll King, drawing undue attention to herself like some self-proclaimed goddess who knew no fear. Throg would teach her to be afraid. Knowing the lay of the land better than any man, the Wintertooth waited patiently for his prey to march into the perfect position before raising his stone hammer and roaring. Finally unleashed, the trolls hefted their clubs in response before charging down the hill into the enemy below. Thousands upon thousands of dead turned at the sound, shambling into some semblance of a battle line at the will of their mistress. It made little difference. The monstrous creatures slammed into the zombies, scattering rotten corpses in all directions. Although Hela had gathered a tide of undead too massive for any human army to successfully combat, numbers were of no concern to a few hundred starving trolls. The thick press of undead bodies that normally proved to be their strength was suddenly a grave weakness, as each troll could simply swing their club to smash apart dozens of bodies. Worse still, the legions of Hela were helpless as their constant assault of minor wounds that would wear down most foes was shrugged off by swiftly regenerating flesh. Throg led from the front, casually crushing zombies with lazy swings of his stone hammer and glaring around for the source of the necromancy. He knew there had to be some type of wizard nearby, though whether it be a necromancer or a vampire remained to be seen. After the charge split the undead column in half, it didn't take long for Hela Half-Dead to come riding towards the threat to her army. A whirlwind of dark magic surged around her as the Master Necromancer shouted out incantations to raise her fallen troops. The Troll King turned at her approach as all the dead around him began to raise up. Now that the Witch had revealed herself, it was time to wrap this up. Unleashing the power of his crown on his kin, all of the trolls snapped their heads in Hela's direction and unleashed a torrent of vomit. The rancid bile dissolved any flesh it touched, clearing a steaming path directly up to the necromancer. Throg stormed forwards with his troops following close behind, the monstrous brutes shoveling as much of the undead into their maws as possible. He could see the bewildered panic on the woman's face. Her barrier of undead had been annihilated in an instant, and she couldn't reconstitute bodies from puddles of melted corpses or those being tossed into empty stomachs. In an act of desperation, Hela summoned her foul magics and unleashed a torrent of dark magic at the Troll King. The Wintertooth only laughed as he continued to wade towards her, his flesh regenerating even as it rotted away. There was no incantation that could save this arrogant human from his wrath. The necromancer tried to flee, but was far too slow and further isolated by Throg's own copious vomit boiling away undead reinforcements. He raised up his hammer and with a grunt brought it down with shattering force, crushing Hela half-dead with a wet crunch. Even as her insides leaked out to color the surrounding snow, the magic binding the Legion of Dead evaporated, and all of the zombies collapsed. Throg roared his victory and stomped his foot upon the woman's remains, before glaring at the seemingly endless number of corpses lying about. 
his army would eat well tonight. And that concludes the famous battle section. We will now move on to the end times. Of course, if you are avoiding end times lore because either you hate it or because you do not want it spoiled for you for some reason, the comment section below has timestamps for all the sections, so you can just skip to closing thoughts. Uh, also, if you are reading the Gotrek and Felix series of novels and you do not want the with part one of the end times for Gotrek and Felix spoiled, which is the book Kinslayer, that features Throg, so we will be talking about that. So if for some reason you don't want to hear this part, you can go ahead and skip below. For the rest of you, uh, so here's essentially Throg's role in the end times. When the end times begins, chaos sweeps south uh, before the Arik Bastion, essentially, and completely wipes Kislev off the face of the earth. Uh, Kislev and all of its isolated cities put up pretty good isolated fights, but ultimately are just crushed, annihilated, and defeated. Gotrek Gurnison at this point was already up there, um, which we'll get into in a bit. I don't know why I just said that. But anyway, so Throg uh, was at the city of Prague. And much to everyone's surprise, instead of joining forces with the rest of Chaos, Throg instead led his entire army into Prague and allied with a bunch of different kinds of monsters. You know, from Chaos Giants to a Dragon Ogre Shaggith to just a bunch of stuff. And he basically took the city by force and barricaded it from the inside to prevent any of the other forces of Chaos from getting in. So he was surrounded by Warriors of Chaos, Norskins, Chaos Dwarves, Demons. Everybody wanted a piece of Throg, but because his army was so ludicrously powerful, nobody could get to him. And he basically turned Prague into his own personal city and his capital for his new world, essentially. Um, so after that point, he basically started paying bounty hunters, uh, slavers and all sorts of other individuals to bring him wizards. And so, and he, of course, sent out groups of trolls or monsters to also gather up wizards, and he was taking all comers. You know, great uh, Skaven, Grey Seers, and Warlock Engineers, Necromancers, Vampires, Human Sorcerers, just whatever he could get his hands on. So he brought in all these wizards, and Throg tasked all of them with creating intelligent trolls. So basically, at this point in the lore, Throg was alone, and he was kind of lonely to an extent. I think it had more to do with the fact that he couldn't control all of the trolls at once to make a cohesive army that could take over the world. But if he had another troll just like him, or if there were all the trolls could think, then he would have the most powerful army in the world without a doubt. Because trolls physically are pretty much the best race there is in the Warhammer universe when it comes to being soldiers. The problem is they're complete idiots and they're just stupid as hell. So all of these wizards were tasked with no matter what they had to do or what it would take to create intelligent trolls. So one of the people he kidnaps is a friend of Gotrek and Felix's from much earlier in their um, sagas who shows up in a number of books, Max Scriber. And basically uh, the Gotrek and Felix book Kinslayer occurs where Gotrek and Felix kind of go through their adventures, and I won't get super into what they did, but they come to Prague, and they fight uh, Throg's army. So they basically fight their way inside the city, um, where we do see, for the first time, Throg demonstrate his ability to directly control another creature, because he possesses a Chaos Troll who is fighting in the outskirts of the city, and that troll goes from being kind of dangerous, but something Gotrek and Felix can handle, to being a really serious threat that is incredibly dangerous and takes an entire party of very skilled heroes to even have a chance of taking on. Um, because the heroes had essentially launched an assault against Throg and he wasn't having it. He used that direct possession and some other shenanigans he had up his sleeve. He basically manipulated them into a no-win situation. And he captured Ulrika the Vampire, who is, of course, Felix's lover and was leading the escapade. And he managed to uh, basically defeat Gotrek and Felix, or at least push them back. And um, so he captures Ulrika, and he basically takes her down into the pit of his dungeon. And Throg, at this point, is surrounded, and he's not very happy about being surrounded. And he's trying to find a way to win the battle. So, Ulrika was expressly sent there by Vlad, 
as kind of a side mission. She lured Felix and Gotrek along as kind of protection and insurance and claiming they were there to save Max. But what Ulrika, which she did because he was a previous lover of hers, but what she really wanted or what she really was sent for by Vlad von Karstein was to basically proposition Throg to join an alliance with the undead and the Empire against the Hordes of Chaos and basically secure himself a place in the New World where he could have his own Empire if he was willing to ally with them. You know, basically an Empire of Monsters. Um, which Throg doesn't really go for this plan. Uh, he thinks that... The forces in the south are weak, and they're only asking for his uh, help because they're stronger. He is stronger than them, and he refuses to ally with anyone that he perceives as being weaker than him, because it would just cause him too much trouble, and he doesn't want to leave Prague. So he essentially, being a very nasty, clever individual, knows that Ulrika is hungry for blood, and that if she does not feed she could become a monster, like a Vargeist, essentially, or a Vargulf. So he basically leaves her alone in a chamber with a troll. And the problem with that is that if Ulrika gives in to her temptations and feeds on the troll, it's going to be really, really bad. She'll basically go insane and some other problems. So he then returns outside, where Gotrek and Felix are launching a rescue mission for Ulrika, and they have Snorri and some other old friends of theirs. And Throg goes out to fight them, but instead of fighting them himself, because he has other matters to attend to, um, well, he shows up and he intends to fight them himself alongside his dragon ogre Shagath, who is like the ultimate pinnacle of his army. So he summons out the Shagath, who goes after Gotrek, and Throg basically decides, alright, I'm going to kill both of them here, I'm just going to deal with this myself, but at that moment, he feels an incredible amount of pain. Something just like, he basically gets a migraine on steroids and is like bleeding from multiple orifices and he suddenly realizes that something is terribly wrong. So he goes up to his tower where he's keeping all his wizards where it's revealed that Max has successfully created an intelligent troll. The problem is he took Throg's insistence that there is no price too great a little too seriously and the way he was able to create an intelligent troll was by utilizing a mixture of the winds and he basically sacrificed the life of every single troll inside of Prague with the exception of Throg and the troll he was experimenting on. So he created an intelligent troll, but it caused every single other troll in the entire city to drop dead. So Throg's army was literally cut into a fraction and he lost his basically his entire foot soldier legion you know very powerful foot soldier legion so his defenses completely collapsed which meant that all of the forces outside the walls were now attacking vigorously because they realized the trolls were no longer alive so the chaos dwarves the words of chaos and a bunch of other legions basically just launched into them um and throg at this point's pretty pissed uh this new troll that was created wasn't even in, it was intelligent but it was like a baby so it was like aware of the world and ha was had the capacity to think but it was like a newborn which was not what throg had in mind and of course throg once he got what he thinks he wanted he realizes that he's jealous and doesn't want to share his intelligence so he doesn't want anything to do with this new troll and it uh, is killed i believe shortly thereafter so at this point um snorri who is a friend of gotrek and felix's he's another slayer comes up and fights throg one-on-one -on -one. And the two of them tussle, but Throg completely overwhelms Snorri and basically beats him to death. Uh, after that point, Gotrek and Felix arrive on the scene, and before they can attack Throg, Ulrika shows up because Throg summoned her. And the caveat to what happened is when she drank the troll's blood because she finally gave in, she basically became bestial and savage, and that gave Throg's Wintertooth crown the ability to influence and control her. So he basically tells her to hold off Gotrek and Felix because he's going to flee Prague now, but there are things that he needs before he leaves. So he runs up to the toppest tower where his personal quarters are to grab some stuff while Ulrika fights Gotrek and Felix, and I won't spoil how that ends. Um, and so at the very, very end, Gotrek and Felix make their way up to the tippy top of the tower. Well, Gotrek gets there first, and him and Throg just start wailing on each other. 
And it's an interesting fight. It's not by any means the closest encounter of the Gotrek and Felix series. Throg is not quite as monstrous as things that Gotrek has gotten very used to fighting. The only thing he has going for him is that he can regenerate as fast as Gotrek can do damage to him. But the problem is Gotrek isn't alone. He has friends, and for all that Gotrek may... And although Throg can sustain his healing against Gotrek, he's stuck, essentially. He can't break out, and he can't actually kill Gotrek, because Gotrek's just way too skilled for Throg. So they fight, they fight, they fight, and at this point, Throg starts bar trying to bargain. He tries to bargain with Gotrek by telling him, you know, I've got the Book of Grudges from one of the Lost Dwarf Holds, I think Carrick Vlag, and I've got, like, all these famous treasures, because, you know, Throg is a hoarder, um, and does like fancy things. And Godrek basically tells him to screw himself, and then he offers to Felix that, okay, I've reconsidered, and I'm now willing to join an alliance with mankind and the undead, if you'll spare my, like, if you'll spare my life and stop fighting me, then I will agree to join you guys against the, uh, the hordes of chaos and the dark gods. And Felix tells him, no, you know, you're too monstrous, we would, it, it would be pointless for us to ally with something like you. And Throg gets incredibly angry at this point, and basically battles very, as best he can against Gotrek and Felix. And in the end, what happens to him is that he basically ends up with his back against a window, and Gotrek is, has pinned down Throg's hammer against the ground by standing on it. And so Throg, uh, in a moment of trying to be clever, basically throws his hammer back over his head as hard as he can, with the hope that it would cause Gotrek to then go flying out the window. Um, well, or the well, it's more of a giant hole he made in the wall. But unfortunately for him, Gotrek is basically smarter than him, and Gotrek just cuts the haft of Throg's hammer, so when Throg throws his arms over his head, there's no weight, so he just literally throws himself backwards, and he tumbles off the edge and falls down to the Court of Heroes, which is super long way down. And every, it's presumed that he's dead. Um, however, though, it's revealed later on in the end times in the final battle for Middenheim that Throg did not die from the fall. He definitely did not enjoy the fall and probably it hurt a lot, but he didn't die. And the Dark Gods, along with a bunch of other different characters, basically picked him up and dropped him off in Middenheim to help Archaon with his defense against the various incarnates. So at this point... Archaon, or Throg, has basically decided to throw in... He kind of pulled a 180 because the authors probably didn't consult each other. And this Throg is completely for the Dark Gods. And he basically uh, is, like, there to fight for them and honor them and do what he can to help end the world at this point. But it does mention that he seems rather beat up and... Uh, but his, he still has his hammer, magically. So, in any event, he gets... Uh, Archeon tells Sigvald and Throg that they have to go hold off Nagash. And Sigvald does not take kindly to being partnered with an ugly troll, because Sigvald is vain as shit. So Sigvald uh, basically tries to attack Archeon, and Throg grabs him and like pins his hand in place on his sword and is like, Yeah, no, we're, we're leaving. So the two of them go to fight, and of course while Throg is walking ahead of Sigvald, Sigvald tries to kill him. Sigvald just stabs him in the back. And Throg pretends to die because he doesn't want to fight Sigmar right on because that's not a fight he would necessarily relish and they have a job to do. So he pretends to be dead. Sigvald runs past him to go fight Nagash and ends up fighting Krell and I've talked about that in Sigvald's video. And then Throg basically waits um, until he fully regenerates and then he goes down and he finds Archon the Black fighting. So he attacks Archon the Black, and the two of them exchange a couple blows. They don't fight a bunch. They fight for a little bit. And after they fight for a bit, uh, Sigvald uh, kills Krell, but he is broken and ruined. And as he's basically screaming his anguish to the sky, Throg runs up behind him and just slams his hammer into uh, Sigvald like a sideways swipe and just, just obliterates him, essentially. And then in the personal novel version, this is where Throg proceeds to uh, empty his bladder on Sigvald's corpse because Throg hated him. Um, 
At this point, uh, Throg leads his monstrous horde full scale against Nagash's undead horde and basically fights Nagash to a standstill. Um, at least Nagash's army. And Nagash is like, well, shit, I don't have time for this. So Nagash goes after Throg and basically just picks him up because Nagash is gigantic. And he tells Throg either, you, you know, you're impressive and either you can agree to serve me forever or I'm just going to kill you right now. And Throg's response is basically along the lines of, I would never serve you, Nagash, because there's no hope of ever being anything by serving you because you're eternal stagnation. At least the Dark Gods, as terrible as they are, offer the hope of being becoming something more. So no, I'm not going to serve you. And Nagash says, all right, that's fair, and stabs him with his sword of just overpoweredness, and Throg basically just turns into dust and dies. Um, and that's the end of Throg the Troll King. All right, so we're on to the final section, which is closing thoughts, and this is the most casual section, which is why I like it. So a um, couple thoughts about Throg that are kind of interesting. Uh, one, that his representation in Total War Warhammer is actually really interesting compared to his End Times representation, because Throg never showed up in a novel prior to the End Times. You can, Of course, he was in your army book, but he didn't have any speaking lines or anything. So the way they conveyed his intelligence in these two mediums actually ended up being very different. In the end times, Throg is incredibly intelligent. He can like he speaks almost poetically and is incredibly philosophical and smart and he's very the way that his like trollness is shown in his new intelligence is that he's very cruel and he's very greedy and he possesses all these really dangerous qualities. But he is incredibly smart. Um, like, he's probably one of the smartest uh, Lords of Chaos in that he was able to, like, when it comes to strategy, he was able to outgun or outmaneuver Echold Hellbrass, who was a, who is an insanely famous and powerful Chaos Lord of Zinch. And Throg literally captured him alive because he beat him so bad and then basically set him loose against the Empire. But Throg was terrifyingly intelligent in the end times uh, he appreciated culture and art and treasure and when you see his personal quarters during the go trek and Fe the end of the go treks and felix novels he has all of these like amazing treasures that don't necessarily have a monetary value they have a knowledge value or they're like really priceless artwork or something and he appreciates those things so he is this really really smart individual who, he's not smart for a troll, he's just smart. Um, he's a bit of a survivalist, but th that's kind of the way he ends up. In Total War Warhammer, he went from being incredibly smart to just being smart for a troll. <laughs> you know, he kind of speaks like... He speaks like if you were... If someone were to come to you and say, there's a troll character who has the ability to talk, that's what Throg is like. He doesn't really come off as a really impressive or intelligent individual. He sort of comes off as like this really, um, like he's smart, but he's still a troll, if you know what I mean. So it's it's interesting to see how those differences wound up. Um, like Games Workshop literally just abandoned their End Times version of him for the version that Total War Warhammer made. Because I imagine... Creative Assembly did have to get approval to make sure that their characters represent are represented properly, which means someone at Games Workshop had to have okayed this version of Throg, who's very different than the novel's version of Throg. But, of course, those being only in Times novels, because in the Words of Chaos army book, Throg could be easily either one. They don't really specify exactly how intelligent he is, but he could easily be smart for a troll or just really smart. Because um, he the tro the Throg in Total War Warhammer is still capable of speech and complex enough ideas to at least lead an army and, you know, force monstrous creatures under his banner and all that stuff. So, um, as far as the way Throg was developed, I really, really like Throg in Total War Warhammer. Um, his vomit ability ability turned out a bit disappointing in my opinion. I would have much preferred it to be a breath attack like wind blast or brace scream or something, instead of that weird single target magic missile. It's it's super bizarre and it doesn't do very it doesn't really do anything. 
So that's a bit unfortunate because in tabletop, Throg, Throg is one of the most terrifyingly overpowered characters in tabletop because he's super cheap, but his abilities are fucking ridiculous because his vomit attack alone can almost one-shot any character in the game if you're not careful. Like, going up against Throg in close combat is one of the scariest things in 8th edition tabletop because if he vomits on you, he he just ignores all of your defenses and has a perfectly good chance of just killing you on the spot. Um, on top of that, he had a really good stat line and he functioned as a general and a battle standard bearer even if he was not your general and battle standard bearer for other monsters. In addition, he made Chaos Trolls count as a core type. So when you built your tabletop army, um, you, normally 25% of your army had to be dedicated to basic troops to give it kind of like, to make sure your army was grounded in the aesthetic. Something that didn't really translate into Total War. But, it, so it'd be like, you know, in Total War if you had to spend 25% of your funds on like the most basic of troops. But Throg, if you brought him in the army, he could just take trolls. Lots and lots and lots of trolls. And on top of that, he could act as a secondary general for them and rally their leadership. And he was terrifying. He was absurdly strong. And there was nothing worse than seeing him across the table from you at a tournament. Because you just knew you were going to have a bad time. Trying to kill him was insanely difficult. Um, and he was a tough cookie to crack, especially when he was hiding in his troll hordes. Um, but other than that, I thought CA um, developed him really well. I like the way he looks, I like the way he feels, I like the way he plays. Of course, we're waiting for him to be put into Total War Warhammer 2, but I'm a patient man. Uh, I think we have May for Throg, so it's unfortunate, but at least he's playable in Game 1, so it's not like we're completely waiting for Norska, we're just waiting for them to catch up with the rest of the world. But in any event, uh, that's pretty much all my thoughts on Throg. He's not a super complicated character to talk about. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you all have a great winter break for those of you preparing to end school for the semester. And I will see you next time. Bye.